During the past months, most of the foreign news in the West and the Middle East was dominated by the war in South Caucasus between uh, Armenia, Karabakh and Azerbaijan, who was openly assisted and controlled by the Turkish military, Turkish hired mercenaries and the ISIL terrorists. Uh, I would like to present a few facts through maps in order to clarify the histories of Armenia and Azerbaijan and the source of the conflict. The oldest world map, which is in the British Museum, is a clay tablet dating back to the 6th century BC. The tablet shows three countries in the center of the world, which are Babylon, Assyria and Armenia. The next is the Behistun inscriptions. About the same time, the Persian king Darius the Great left a huge cuneiform inscription on a rock face in Behistun. Western Persia, when he also writes about revolts in the neighboring Armenia, etc. The description is in the three languages, where the name of the country appears in the following manner. In Persian, Armenia, in Elamite, Harminuya, in Babylonian, Urartu thus confirming that the name Urartu refers to Armenia. Herodotus writes about Armenia in his histories dating from the 5th century BC. This map was drawn as per the descriptions provided by him. Towards the center of this map are the two countries which are st still exist today. These are Armenia and Persia. Suffice to say that at the time none of the European countries existed. Wugon this Middle East map of the early stages of the wo uh, world. The French mapmaker Robert Wugon drew this ancient monarchies map in his 1760 atlas. As we can see here, there are many countries in the Middle East. Greater and lesser Armenians both appear on it, and there are also Atropaten, the province of Iran. A map of Asia in the early ages, dating 1726. At the time, in the region of the Middle East, there were over 30 countries and kingdoms, but out of these, today only two exist. These are Armenia and Iran. Here's the situation of the South Caucasus in 2015. Here we see the layout of region at present, as I said. Armenia is surrounded by Georgia, a country which has appeared in the year 1008 as a unified country containing the regions of Abkhazia, Imeretia, Kakhetia, Mingrelia, Ajaria, etc. Turkey appeared on these maps only in the 14th century that is 2,000 years after Armenia. As far as our eastern neighbor Azerbaijan is concerned, located north of the river Arax, this country appeared only in 1918. The other old country in this region is Iran, located south of Armenia, which is also an, in old Armenian, we call the province of it Atropaten, which is Azerbaijan of Iranian province of Azerbaijan today. The world of Tigran the Great, 60 BC. At one time, during the reign of the Tigran the Great, around 95 to 55 BC, Armenia ruled the area from the Caspian to the Mediterranean seas, outlined in blue. But it was considered a threat to the Romans, who united and attacked Armenia, driving Tigran back to the limits of Greater Armenia, which was the Euphrates River. During the first century, Strabo writes about Armenia in his 17-volume Geographia, mentioning it on more than 60 pages. The map shows Strabo's world where Armenia is underlined red. In the second century, Greek geographer Ptolemy, who is considered to be the father of cartography actually, prepared a world map. This is a section from that map where greater and lesser Armenians are shown underlined red. To the northeast we can see Caucasian Albania, Aghwank in Armenian, underlined blue, where according to Strabo lived 26 tribes who spoke different languages. During the 4th century almost all these tribes became Christian and after the Arab invasion during the 8th to 9th centuries most converted to Islam. Media, in green here, is the old name of the Iranian province of Azerbaijan, located south of the Arax River. From ancient times, 
throughout the Greco-Roman, Islamic, and Western civilizations, Armenia has appeared on all maps of the region. Even when the land had been split between the Persian and Byzantine empires, the name Armenia appears on old maps because simply because Armenian people lived in these areas. This covers the region from the present day of Eastern Turkey, east of Turkey, court, uh, to the present day of Armenia and Karabakh. Here are a few samples of the medieval maps, all showing Armenia and none showing Azerbaijan north of Arax River. This world map was made in Spain in, in the 8th century by Bishop Beatus. It shows part of the world where between the Caucasus and the Taurus Mountains we see Armenia, underlined red. North of Armenia we see the Christian country of Albania, but there is no Azerbaijan. Here, east as at the top of the map. This one is the French world map of the 12th century, where Asia is at the top of part of the map circle, where there are two Armenians, Greater Armenia and Cilician Kingdom of Armenia, in the northeast corner of Mediterranean, marked by arrows. At the time, Cilician Armenia had commercial ties with Europe and was recognized as such. Armenia here appears in the Mis Islamic geography maps. Here is a 10th century map by Istakhri, a famous Persian geographer. We chose Armenia in the world map, underlined red. Here also Azerbaijan is a province of Iran. Framaro was a Venetian cartographer who made his famous world map in 1460. In this section from this map, we see the region of the Middle East and the map south is at the top. The sea on the left is the Caspian and on the right is the Black Sea while top right is the corner of the Mediterranean. Here we see Armenia repeated in four different locations, underlined red, while Mount Ararat and Noah's Ark are shown in blue, and Karabakh Mountains are indicated green. Armenia with Mount Ararat Noah's Ark can also be seen on the first globe of the earth, made in 1492, where America is not yet shown as it was not yet discovered. Neither is Azerbaijan. This is a Dutch world map by Ortelius, made in 1595. In the detail shown, we see the Middle East and South Caucasus, where countries shown are in the South Caucasus are Armenia, Persia, Syria, and Egypt further south. Even Turkey is absent, and there is no Azerbaijan. On this detail of Kohler's map of Asia, which is dated 1718, we see the South Caucasus, where Armenia is divided between the Persian, Ottoman, and Russian empires, and the name Armenia appears his all, all over the area where Armenians lived, that is, from the Euphrates River to Armenia and Karabakh of today. On all these maps, we saw Armenia is shown as a country or region, while Azerbaijan is only shown as an Iranian province located south of the Arax River. Here is Delil's map of the South Caucasus, dated 1731. In late Middle Ages, the region today known as Azerbaijan was ruled by Persian and or Turkish Khans, who ruled the land that was generally known as Shirvan. Even then, the Armenian Meliks, the landowners of the mountainous Karabakh, stayed partially independent, paying their taxes to the Khans. During all this time, there was no country named Azerbaijan located north of the Arax River. Here, Armenia is highlighted yellow, Georgia is in red, Iranian Azerbaijan unrighted, uh, is in maroon, Today's Azerbaijan occupies the region which used to be the Khanets, underlined green, known under the overall name of Shirvan. During the 19th century, even the Ottoman Empire agreed that their eastern part was named Armenia. Azerbaijan was shown as an Iranian province. This Ottoman dates from the 1803-04, confirming the presence of Armenia 
while also confirming the absence of Azerbaijan north of the Arax River. This is once again confirmed by another Ottoman map dated by, from 1877, where Azerbaijan is shown as a province of Iran and in its stead the area north of the Arax River is named Shirvan. The first massacres of the Armenian population in the Ottoman Empire happened in 1894-96, whereby many left their homeland, dispersing into the neighboring countries as can be seen on this map. Many European powers and the USA complained, but nothing was done. After some 20 years later, this killing was followed by the implementation of the Armenian genocide by the Turkey during 1915 to 1923. The map shows the centers where these massacres and deportations of over 2 million Armenians took place. Here is the map of the Pan-Turkic belt as planned to establish by the Pan-Turkist movement. As mentioned, the Ottoman government began implementing their plan of cleansing the region from non-Muslim Armenians and other Christian minorities through genocide and deportations, because they were a wedge inserted between the Turkish-speaking nations extending from Europe to Central Asia and Siberia. Thus, historic Armenia was cleansed from its ethnic peoples who either were forcibly driven to the deserts or massacred outright. From over two million Armenians living in their, home, their homelands under the Turkish yoke, one and a half million perished. Here is the map of the First Republic of Armenia in 1918. After the First World War, the Russian Empire disappeared and south of the Caucasus, Armenia and Georgia declared their first independent republics, retaining their old names. But there was also a new unnamed Muslim pub Republic, which was originally to be named Southeastern Caucasian Muslim Republic. However, after the consultation of the leader of the extremist Musawat party, I mean Rasulzadeh and Ataturk, they borrowed the name of the neighboring Iranian province and decided to call the new country of mainly Turks and Tatars by the same name, Azerbaijan. There were protests against this duplication of names by Iran, but to no avail. In 1920, in Armenia, the first act of the communists who had now overrun the three republics of the South Caucasus, was to donate big chunks of Armenian territory to her neighbors. Lenin intended to encourage the newly emerged Turkish nationalist Ataturk to join the communist camp to this end and do donated the region of Kars, Ani, and the oldest capital of Armenia and Mount Kararat to Turkey. As we will see, Stalin would also give the mostly Armenian populated Karabakh and Nakhichevan to Azerbaijan. In 1921, the Azerbaijani and Armenian parliaments agreed that the chiefly Armenian populated regions of Karabakh and Nakhichevan were to be within the borders of Armenia. This decision was printed in the newspapers of Baku, Moscow and Yerevan and here the wording of these decisions as they appear in the news media of the time. The workers' government of Azerbaijan greets the victory of the rebellious peasantry of brotherly Armenian nation and the establishment of Soviet socialist rule. As of today, the border disputes between Armenia and Azerbaijan are declared resolved. Mountainous Karabakh, Zangezur and Nakhichevan are considered part of the Soviet Republic of Armenia. From the other side, based on the declaration of the Revolutionary Committee of the Soviet Socialist Republic of Azerbaijan and the agreement between the Soviet Socialist Republic of Armenia and Azerbaijan, it is hereby declared that here and after mountainous Karabakh is henceforth integrated part of the Soviet Socialist Republic of Armenia. However, Stalin visited the region in June 1921 
and reversed this decision, handing Armenian populated Karabakh and Nakhijewan to Azerbaijan, the first of the, with the status of autonomous region, and the second as an autonomous republic. Thus, the newly born Republic of Azerbaijan was confirmed by the communists. Here is the map of the region in 1920s. Now, north of the Araks River, Azerbaijan was a newly country established in 1918, but the communists insisted that each of the republics should have their own dedicated history and culture. Here was a new, new country established recently with borrowed name, no dedicated culture and history. This has to be put right by taking the appropriate actions. First, in order to claim ind indigenous ancestry, the Azerbaijanis claim that they are the descendants of the Christian Albanian tribes, thus making themselves an old country. Here is how to become an old country. To make individual history and culture for a newly born country, the following steps that need to be taken. Make sure that the local indigenous population changes its name, or alternatively, is proven to be newcomers in the area. To appropriate all local culture and customs, calling them your own. Claim that all the historic monuments were built by your ancestors, Therefore, as there is claim that all churches of monast and monasteries were built by Albanians. But in this case, they have forgotten that most of Albanian tribes had converted to Islam during the 8th to 9th centuries and therefore could not have built the churches and the monasteries found in Azerbaijan and Karabakh. Now, you should claim that the historical events happened with the participation of your own ancestors and if, for any reason, a monument or event cannot be appropriated, just destroy and or forget them. They successfully did this to the medieval Armenian cemetery of Julfa, where stood over 5,000 Armenian inscribed tombstones. All were destroyed and disposed by the Azeri army. All the above steps are rigorously followed. Now, the renaming of monuments. The Academy of Sciences of Azerbaijan went as far as even printing a book naming Armenia as Western Azerbaijan, appropriating all Christian and other ancient monuments in Armenia as Turkish Christian and Turkish Albanian. As I said, they just overlooked the fact that Albanians had accepted Islam during the 8th to 9th centuries and could hardly have built a plethora of 10th or 17th to 17th century churches existing in the region. Therefore, the concept of the Christian Turks was invented in order to justify existing of these churches of monasteries. Azerbaijan was established in 1918, but until 1936, the population of the Azerbaijan, which was Turkish, and Kurd and different minorities called itself Turks and Muslims, while the Russians called them Tatars. It was only after the decision of the Central Committee of the Communist Party in 1936 that this ethnic system of the Azerbaijan was changed to Azeri. In other words, overnight it was officially changed from Turk to Azeri. In order to claim ancient ancestry, Azerbaijanis say that the Albanians are their forefathers, yet at the same time not wanting to estrange their, themselves from their ally Turkey, they also claim to be of Central Asian origin and descent and they claim that Central Asian Turks are actually the natives of Asia Minor. To this end, they explain the following. In the colors of their flag, the blue band indicates Turkic origin, the green relates to Islamic faith, and the red signifies democracy and modernity. 
Furthermore, when solidarity with Turkey is needed, they even claim that Azerbaijanis and Turks are one people split into two different countries by the Persian and Russian overlords. This theory goes back to the 19th century when the pan-Turkic ideas were formed in Shirvan and Turkey in 1880s. The active terrorist organization of Grey Wolves is the military wing of this organization. This controversy is still ongoing amongst the Azerbaijani historians, whether they are Turks or Albanians. However, this proves to be a controversial impasse. As we saw, the Azeris, depending on the situation, claim to have a 3,000-year-old country, boasting old Albanians as their ancestors. Somehow, this supposedly 3,000-year-old country has no written language and script. Until the 1850s, the official language of the area was Persian, and they were writing in Persian. No local language test exists predating 1850. The population of present-day Azerbaijani Republic consists of Turks, Kurds, members of many tribes, as uh, Strabo has said, Iranian Talashis, Lesgins, Tsakhurs, Avars, Udis, etc. Yet, instead of being proud of having the best of the constituent cultures, Mr. Aliyev claims that all of these people are the Azerbaijanis and have one culture. The indigenous people's languages are banned. Another lesson learned from Atatürk. Here is the map of Soviet Armenia in 1928. After redrawing of the borders by Stalin, the Armenians were left with the smallest republic of the USSR. But this also did not last very long. Between the years of 1928 and 38, Azeri herders gradually moved to better Armenian pastures and established themselves and the Soviet government built them schools and housing, etc. And thus, the region marked blue became populated by mainly Azeris and were incorporated inside the territory of Republic of Azerbaijan. One of the regions appropriated was the southeast of Sevan, which has one of the most important water resources of Armenia. From 1921 to 1990, inside Azerbaijan, the Armenian population of Karabakh was repressed by the central of the Azeri government. It was done through closing of the Armenian universities, Armenian radio programs, and delaying, even preventing economic growth. Uh, during the World War II, one out of 19 Azerbaijanis were sent to the war, while from the Armenian population, one out of three was sent. These and other manners of ethnic cleansing were practiced in order to reduce the Armenian population of Karabakh and Nakhichevan. I must say that they were partially successful. By the late 80s, Nakhichevan's Armenian population, who was almost 50%, was driven away, and today there are no Armenians in Nakhichevan. Neither are any traces of the multitude of Armenian monuments that existed for centuries. Numerous uh, petitions for the independence from Azerbaijan were sent to this USSR central government, but all were completely ignored. In 1988, the population of Armenians in Karabakh expressed their wish to become free from the yoke of the Azerbaijan and asked for Karabakh to join Armenia. The answer of the Azerbaijani government was to organize pogroms. Armenians have not forgotten those programs which took place in Sumgait, an industrial city near Baku, where Armenian civilians were murdered by Azeri mobs in their homes, and no one was really punished. Today, in Azerbaijan, children in school are thought anti-Armenian propaganda by naming the Armenians murderers <clears throat> and sworn enemies of the Azeris and instigating all manners of hatred 
towards anything Armenian. During the last months of the USSR, Armenians of Karabakh, fully in compliance with the ruling regulations, organized a referendum and declared independence as per USSR constitution and the UN Charter of Charter's principle of self-determination. Subsequently, the Azeri army started shelling of the capital Stepanakert with Grad missiles, etc., and the 1991-94 war began. Eventually culminating in the victory of Karabakh over the Azeri government forces. As well as liberating most of Artsakh, Armenian forces occupied their security belt or buffer zone around them in order to prevent the possible Azeri shooting or, or shelling of Artsakh border towns and villages. Eventually, the Russians arranged a ceasefire and the OSCE Minsk group were set up to begin negotiations for peace. Here is the map of Armenia and Artsakh with the surrounding territories during 2015. During the 25 years of negotiations to find peaceful solutions, the Aliyev regime always insisted that, as per precondition, all lands, including Karabakh and Artsakh or Artsakh, should be returned to their original owners, the Azeris. Only after that they will agree for a referendum. They forget that the Armenians have lived on these lands for over 2,000 years, while Azerbaijan is what itself was born in 1918 but claims ownership of the local lands for over 2,000 years. In 2016, as well as last July, there were attempts to intimidate Armenia, attacking as well as Arme Armenia as well as Karabakh. Both times they were unsuccessful because Azerbaijan did not have outside help. Enter Big Brother Turkey, who seems to have assured Azerbaijan that they will lead a blitzkrieg and occupy Artsakh within a few days. In July, under the pretext of joint military maneuvers, they had already brought military hardware, artillery, tanks, and experts, as well as a few F-16 US jet fighters with pilots and military drones, they all brought to Baku which were left in Azerbaijan and were deployed during the surprise attack of September 27. They also hired thousands of mercenaries, Syrian and ISIL mercenaries, and sent them to Azerbaijan, some of whom were dressed with Azeri border guard uniforms. The Blitzkrieg did not succeed, and according to their pr previous practices, instead, the Azeri and the Turkish artillery and on drones began targeting civilians and civil infrastructures with Israeli and Turkish rockets and cluster bombs, causing huge damage and civilian casualties. Their military might turn to Stepanakert and Shuchi, targeting hospitals, churches and even mosques. One NATO Turkish F-16 fighter even shot down an Armenian jet which at the time was flying 60 kilometers inside the Armenian space. On October 10, the Russians arranged a ceasefire for humanitarian purposes to collect the bodies and exchange prisoners. But five minutes after the implementation, Azeris attacked the town of Hadrut and did not stop their all-out attacks and bombardment of civilian targets, even intentionally aiming at international reporters from France, Russia, and the BBC, resulting in many casualties. Subsequently, two more ceasefires were arranged and neither were honored by Azeris, most likely obeying instructions from the Turkish military. On November 2nd, Defense Minister of Turkey, Hulusi Akar, said, there will be no ceasefire until the Armenians leave the occupied territories. This goes to show that now Turkey is in control of the Azerbaijani military, not Aliyev. Azeris want to take only the land of Karabakh, but not its people. If Karabakh is returned to them within a short period, there will be no Armenians in the land who would either have been killed or expelled 
as were over 300,000 Armenians residing in Baku, Sumgayit, and elsewhere in Azerbaijan back in 1989. Their intention to eliminate is to eliminate and exterminate the Armenians, as was confirmed by a few recent terrorist attacks of the over Azeri government forces. In 2004, in the dormitory of a military conference in Budapest, an Azeri officer named Ramil Safarov beheaded the sleeping Armenian officer Gurgen Markarian by an axe. After a few years serving in Hungary, in 2012, Safarov was, went back to Baku to serve the rest of his sentence in Azerbaijan. However, arriving in Baku, he was welcomed as a hero, was promoted in rank, given a flat, a car, all because he had killed an Armenian officer. In 2016, after a surprise attack on the Armenian village of Talish, the Azeri soldiers killed an elderly couple and cut their ears off, taking them as trophies. On October 11, the elite Azeri forces penetrated the Armenian town of Hadrut and in the outskirts killed an elderly woman and her disabled son. In mid-October, two Armenian prisoners of war were executed in the street, while in the video the Azeri leader was taking, he was instructing the soldiers to shoot them in the eye. In other case, handcuffed Armenian prisoners of wars were sh shown dead lying in the street. The perpetrators were idiotic enough to post these images and videos on the Facebook. Two Syrian mercenaries captured at the end of October claimed they were given promise, promised $2,000 per month and additional $100 for each decapitated Gyavur, non-believer which is an Armenian. And the manager of the Azeri Garabakh football club announced that all Armenians should be killed. All the above make genocidal intentions of Azeri and mercenary forces very clear, which could be the continuation of the Armenian genocide perpetrated by the Turks in 1915 and 1920 to 1923. Bombings of the civilian infrastructures targets shows that they are intent in getting rid of the population and take the land without its indigenous peoples. Meanwhile, this tiny country was not only fighting the Azerbaijani forces, controlled and led by the Turkish military, but Turkey itself, as well as the Turkish recruited international terrorists and mercenaries, supplied with weapons from Israel and the US, while the rest of the world was just looking on and advising to stop the fighting. On November 10th, the Prime Minister of Armenia was forced to sign a half-baked announcement with Russia and Azerbaijan to end the hostilities and stop further loss of life. However, because of these unilateral considerations and content, and uh, this so-called announcement has not been fully accepted by the Armenian people. Furthermore, the issues should have been resolved in negotiations with the OSCE Minsk group, who had been given the role of intermediary and not in their absence. President Ergogan once warned that if sanctions are considered against Turkey, then no one could walk the streets of Europe in safety. Terrorist atrocities had already begun in France and in Canada. Unless Turkey and Azerbaijan are controlled, these will spread all over the world. Finally, let us not forget that Turkey is already in Azerbaijan and has a presence there, and it's not going to go away. They're also controlling the military power with Azerbaijan and Aliyev is only a tool in their hands. They're not going to go away. Their overall goal is to complete their genocidal program while extending their power and control over Azeri oil and gas reserves, hence the energy transport pipelines, thus controlling a huge chunk of oil and gas supply that Europe needs. If this is realized, Turkey can dictate their needs and terms to Europe 
and be the overall winner.